Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's and can your voice thunder like his? Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of it like a bird or put it on a leash for the young women in your house? Will traders barter for it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its hide with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. Philip, thank you for taking on this great work. 
Thank you, Ruth and Kitty, for reading those readings. And sorry to land a, a rather long one on you from uh, bits of Job. Can you hear me okay? I don't have a very good history with these things. Uh, I was preaching in Coventry Cathedral not terribly long ago, which has about the world's worst amplification system. And uh, we invited hundreds of people, and actually thousands came. Uh, but we were running into amplification problems halfway through the service. And I thought, well, we might be okay, at least for the sermon, because that microphone is always reliable. Well, on this occasion, it wasn't. And I was accosted by a whole lot of people at the end of the service who said, we just didn't hear a word. I said, well, you must have heard my sermon. They said, no, we didn't hear a word of that either. Then another lot of people sort of accosted them and said, wish you'd told us we could hear every word and we'd have gladly changed places <laughs> with you. So. Well, in this company, I always feel rather parochial. Uh, but I have actually been overseas recently. I was uh, in Denmark uh, taking part in a... Is that overseas? Probably doesn't count as overseas to you, but do you know what it does to me? And, uh, well, I was at a theological consultation and uh, uh, leaving on Thursday, um, well, Philip, you were in my mind, as you had been, actually, for uh, most of the conference, but particularly at that point, not least because I knew that Today was nearly here, and I was going to preach. Anyway, I was walking to my aeroplane, and is this going to work? Yes, I saw this. It's probably not a very fine picture. It was taken on my phone. It's an advertisement. And it says, if you can read it, it's great to have the right answers, but to ask the right questions is genius. And uh, Philip, of course, you'll come and people will be looking to you in some ways uh, for answers or to help those answers to arrive, but uh, to ask the right questions, that's where the genius is to be found. A while ago I was thinking about you and uh, in conversation with Cathy Ross and uh, we discovered we were both preaching on this occasion. Um, and then we worked out that actually Cathy was going to uh, speak a little bit earlier in the day and that I was going to have this slot. And it just so happened that Cathy said she was, going, she was thinking about speaking on John 1, uh, the second half of uh, John uh, 1, when, when the sort of rubber hits the road or when the, the word made flesh starts speaking. And... Um, the genius of Jesus is his capacity to ask the right question. The very first words that come out of the mouth of Jesus in John's Gospel are in the form of a question. It sounds like a very modern question. What are you looking for? He says to these two people who are hanging around him. What are you looking for? A perennial, existential fundamental question that each person needs to answer. What are we looking for? What is our world looking for? They mumble something about not quite knowing where he lives and then, well this is the other one I saw. How, how about this Philip? Problems can be complicated and you'll hit a whole load of those in all their uh, manifold complexity as they uh, land upon you and you'll hear people talking a language that sounds like English but you won't be able to understand a word of it. Um, solutions cannot. Solutions cannot afford uh, to be complicated. The best solutions are those that are simple, elegant in their simplicity and address all of those manifold problems uh, clearly and carefully and thoroughly. The problems of those guys who were hanging around Jesus were cut through with a very simple solution on the part of Jesus. He said, come and see. I mean, that's all there was to it. That was Jesus' first bit of announcement of good news in John's Gospel. Come and see. Come and see if you... And come and see if you... You like what you see as you spend time with me. And then wonderfully we have Andrew, one of the embryonic disciples, 
saying to his brother, come and come with us. We think we've found the Messiah. And then I think this is what uh, Cathy was pointing to earlier today. Philip himself repeats those divine words of Jesus on his lips, come and see. A simple solution to the manifold and complex problems of humanity, of our country, of the church, of the world. Job was a bit of a genius, I think, because he also wanted to be very clear about the questions that he was asking. And he wasn't going to be sort of distracted uh, from a clarity of question um, by his comforters. And we see it early on in, John's go in Job, or John's Gospel, Job's uh, lament, um, where he says in chapter 7 of God, and it's a question that runs through the Bible. What are human beings that you make so much of them? What is man that thou art so mindful of him? What is this phenomenon of creation, a human being? What are human beings that you make so much of them, that you set your mind on them, that you visit them every morning, test them every moment? Will you not look, look away from me for a while? And this is when he begins to lament in a deeper way. Let me alone until I swallow my spittle. If I sin, what do I do to you? You watcher of humanity, why have you made me your target? Why have you become a burden? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. You will seek me, but I shall not be. What are human beings, O oh God? And what are human beings in the face of the evil of the world and the suffering of humanity and the sharp suffering of the innocent? What is humanity in the, in the face of these great tragedies of human life. And what are you, O oh God, in the face of the suffering of humanity, of the evil of the world? What sort of God are you who seems to let evil prevail? What sort of God are you in the face of apparently innocent human suffering? Problems can be complicated, and that is the most complicated problem. The com most complicated theological problem that we face. Job was right to ask that question with a certain sharpness and directness. But as we heard, he does come to an answer. It's not quite at this point an answer that is voiced, but there is a solution to these manifold complications of human life. Excuse me. I know that you can know I know that you can do all things says Job in the final chapter that we heard read Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me which I did not know I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now and this is it now my eyes have seen you. The solution to Job's questioning, his troubles, his suffering, is seeing. In some way he saw the Lord 
and in seeing God was the solution. What is it that he saw? What did he see that so changed his mind, that turned him from the interrogator of God into the one who was humbled by the wonder of what he saw in the face of God? Well, we get some hints, and uh, that's why I wanted Ruth to uh, read to us a little bit of chapter 41 where God describes Leviathan. <laughs> yes, toll the bell for, Lithi for Leviathan. Leviathan in all its terror. Leviathan the sea monster. Leviathan, the embodiment of the deepest fears of the people of God. Leviathan which stood threatening as this enormous chaotic force to thwart the purposes of God, to subdue the people of God, to crush the servants of God. Listen to the description which we didn't hear. I, didn't think I'd test your patience by having the whole of the reading, but it is terrifying. Who can confront it and be safe? Out of its nostrils comes smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. It breathes, kindles, kindles coal, coals, and a flame comes out of its mouth. In its neck abides strength and terror dances before it. The folds of its flesh cling together. It is firmly cast and immovable. And here in the most chilling description, its heart is as hard as stone, as hard as the lower millstone. When it raises itself up, the gods are afraid. At the crashing, they are beside themselves. Who can confront it and be safe? Under the whole heaven, who can but God? Is this what Job sees? God going into the place of human terror? God being so close to the evil of the world that he feels its breath. And God prevailing over it. God confronting it. God taking from it its sting. We have our Leviathans today. They had them in 1779 when they gathered around as the Clapham sect to form and shape CMS, the slave trade, the great injustices in this land. The challenge of proclaiming to the world that Christ is the Lord. They named their, Leviath their Leviathans then, and they put their trust in the God who can confront every Leviathan and win. We have deep and serious problems in our society that calls for a national reform. We have deep and serious issues in our church that call for a deep and profound renewal of spiritual life. We have an urgent missionary need in our land 
for Christ to be made known and for the sways of our own population who hardly know his name or certainly the content of his cause for them to hear the good news that we have and hold and are called to share with our country and with the world. I don't dare to name the great leviathans that threaten our world today. You will be able to identify them clearer than I from the different places that you come from, the different places where you had have experience of the deep and dreadful leviathans that seem to threaten the purposes of God. Did Job see just a little bit more than the Lord fighting Leviathan? Was there a hint in that vision that so overwhelmed him of the great events in the history of the universe which we get a, a picture of in our second reading? as Mary Magdalene runs to the tomb and sees that the stone has been removed and the jaws of death have been opened. And then Peter going into that tomb, into the place of the victory of that great Leviathan which threatened humanity in Job's time and threatened humanity in Jesus' time and appears to threaten humanity in our time the Leviathan of death, that great and last enemy and he and the other, disci and the other disciple as they go into the tomb and see that this tomb is now empty And victory is, as it were, on the other foot. And we're told that even though they have not yet grasped the full impact and meaning of the resurrection, nevertheless, they are beginning to believe. They saw and believed. Are they beginning to... I think they are. They're beginning to make sense of what seemed like an ultimate tragedy in their lives, the death of Jesus. That in that death Jesus was indeed contending with the great beast and now had prevailed. And is this what Job saw? Was this the answer to his question about who, who who human beings are and why God is so interested in them. Was this the answer to his question about who God is in the face of the suffering of creation? That God does battle with evil and overcomes it with, as it were, his own blood. That the problem of the injustice of the suffering of the innocent and the pain of the world finds its answer in the injustice of the suffering and pain of the Son of God. That the answer to the question of what human beings really are, and what they mean to God, and who God really is, is found in this, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, and that this Son, in the fire of eternal love, gave himself over to death for us and for our salvation. 
I don't know whether you've seen this bridge in Denmark. It sort of stretches from Copenhagen to um, Sweden. It links the two lands. Uh, my bedroom window, which was not in a terribly sort of auspicious hotel, but nevertheless it looked out onto that uh, bridge, not quite as, uh, uh, you can see it quite as clearly, but nevertheless, so you can't see it so well there. It really is, oh, I want to go back one, yeah. It's, it's an incredible bridge. And it, I, it, I couldn't help thinking about those, uh, that image that, um, well, impacted me so many years ago of Jesus stretching out between those distant lands of infinite distance between them of divinity and humanity stretching out and uniting the things of God and the things of humanity. The aeroplane from Copenhagen airport uh, flies over the um, uh, the bridge. It sort of begins on one side and then it comes down low and, uh, and it was a beautiful day just like that uh, as we were returning home and I was mesmerized by this bridge and rejoicing in the way it was uniting two separate countries. And then I was closer to it than that actually and then I saw that Oh gosh, this illustration isn't going to work for Saturday because the, the I don't know, someone's blown up the bridge <laughs> or uh, they haven't finished the bridge because it just ends short. I mean, it's like what we used to say, you know, that there are some attempts to bridge that divide between God and the world that just don't make it. But actually this bridge does make it. Um, it becomes a tunnel. <laughs> it plunges into the sea. It goes into the depths. The place of, Le of Leviathan. The place of death. And this is the extraordinary claim that we have about God, that God not only reaches out to humanity but stretches so far that he is stretched out upon the cross in order to enter our deep death and contend with Leviathan in that place and prevail. It's great to have the right answers, but to ask the right questions is genius. Finally, Jesus asks another question at the end of John's Gospel, and it's like a bookend to that first question he asked, what are you looking for? He now says to Mary, weeping Mary, Mary full of her complications, full of her doubts and pain. He says, who are you looking for? That question has now in John's Gospel, with all that has come between it, become not what are you looking for, but who are you looking for? Because Mary knows that all the answers to the questions that she bears are to be found in Jesus. Problems can be complicated and Mary's problems were deeply and dreadfully complicated at this point as all her hopes seemed to have faded into nothing. But the solution was simple. The solution was found in the voice of the risen Christ saying to Mary simply that, Mary calling her name. And Mary's response to Jesus, Rabboni, and then her testimony to the world. Come and see, said Jesus. Come and see, says Philip. And now Mary, 
who has seen the risen Christ says to the world, I have seen the Lord. Philip, you will face many questions. And they will be deep questions and important questions and fundamental questions about human beings and who we are and what is our significance. And are the questions about the Leviathans of this world and how they can be defeated and even questions about who is God in the face of all these other questions. And the answer to those complicated problems, the solution will remain the same. The solution of which Job had a hint in that vision and which Mary Magdalene encountered in that garden. The answer will be and will remain the crucified and risen Jesus who is already there waiting in the garden of resurrection and calling to you and to each and every person and that is the great vision of CMS and SAMS and every other authentic Christian mission agency asking that question well it, calling each person in the world having said what are you looking for who are you looking for and then the risen Jesus from the Garden of Resurrection calls each person by name and invites the response, Jesus. And then having made that response, calls us, calls you, Philip, to continue that mission, that sending that began then, to say, I have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. The crucified and risen Jesus remains the solution to the problems of our world, to the problems of our church, to the problems of our nation. Philip, under your leadership, may CMS go to all the world and say, come and see Jesus. Amen.